Perfect, so let's start. Um, welcome everybody. It's nice to have you here in our session. Um, this year's bench learning project um, has some discussions on, um, on change processes and on the way of um, changing organizations. And we would like to share what we discussed. So it's nothing final, it's nothing, it's, it's still very raw. And um, in our first part, Harald and Simon share some um, insights with you. And then we'd like to find some um, examples from your companies, um, what, what you think on it. Is that fine for everyone? Perfect. <laughs> OK, so. Um, Happy to be here. One reason why we are talking about uh, that um, kind of forced term frame set is because in the last 10 years, we were mainly focusing on skill set. So competencies and skills to run modern tools, new work and all those things. We focused on tool set. So it was in the beginning, uh, it was like enterprise social network, Office 365, whiteboards and all those things. And of course, we figured out tools and skills without the right mindset um, are not very helpful. If you copy your email behavior into enterprise social network, it's not going to work. If you copy your email behavior into Teams or into any other chat, it doesn't work. And if you copy your file behavior from your hard drive into a shared drive or into a cloud drive, it doesn't work. So mindset in terms of what kind of attitude do I have towards my work, my processes, and my uh, and people, most importantly. This is where it touches then leadership. Um, so we figured out mindset, of course, is very important. Uh, mindset nowadays is one of those words which is uh, used basically almost always in the bullshit bingo because it's, it's really something you have to do something about. And uh, often it's just, well, we have to change this person's mindset and you cannot change someone else's mindset. That's scientifically proven, I would say it's impossible. But you can try to change your own beliefs and try to work on your own experiences and that might drive then a different behavior in those different tools combined with skills and tools so skill set tool set mindset very very important very powerful and yet we figured out and uh, my personal big hassle there um, in all the projects i've done in the last 10 years enterprise social network integ uh, integration. I, I did the Office 365 uh, integration at Conti. So we had seven months, every single day, 1,500 people almost migrated from the old version to the new, introducing 25 new tools, introducing network uh, capabilities, introducing cloud services, evergreen, so updates every month. So it was quite a big project and it worked out very well. And that was 2019. Now we have 2023. We have all the uh, information and all the uh, experiences with COVID, with forced home office, with forced digitalization. And now we figure out in some areas or in more and more areas, organizational structures fight back. Might be managers pulling back people from home office because they figure out they cannot lead them anymore might be uh, department heads or hierarchical structures fighting back with siloing, with putting people into focus so they can't help each other anymore, uh, with people trying to micromanage everything in a, in a way that they control it again. Um, and all that probably results from uh, the fear of losing power, the fear of losing uh, the oversight, of the fear of their bosses um, not being able to report anymore what's happening. And it doesn't matter if it's because of networking, because of agile, because of new work mindset and, and whatever it is. So all those changes we have done in the last 10 years, mindset, skill set, tool set, culture changes, at the moment I would say are coming more and more into a certain threat because people lose that power and they want to have back their control. Now, what is control? What, what are our organizations made of, like a hierarchical organization? And I would assume that every one of you is somehow working in a hierarchical organization. Or is anyone working in a pure network organization? 
without hierarchy, or working in a pure agile frame set? I guess not. So either those things don't work, or there's a big force, and you could say, well, maybe 100 years, maybe 2,000 years of uh, hierarchical way of working. There is a big frame set, framing conditions. And uh, if you move a little bit to the right in the screen, we uh, collected already in the bench learning some things to define what is frame set. The, the green part. Yeah. So the first one we figured out, of course, what makes frame set a frame set, it's processes, rules, norms, roles and regulations, management systems. So if I hand over management position to you and say, you are now the manager of this room here. Well, how would you make sure that happens? Well, you somehow have to be more dominant. You somehow have to make sure there's a certain distance between you and every one of us. You have to somehow make sure that you control and know everything what all the others are doing, because else you cannot do your role. So by just giving you a role of management, giving you the power, we change completely the frame conditions in this room. If we would now say, well, now you do it together with Cavo or you do it together with Simon, now you would have to somehow align in a different way with Simon than with every one <coughs> of us. So that would automatically create channels, closed channels probably even. And the same thing is with processes. In my eyes, those frame conditions are mainly coming from for those knowing the Kinefin framework from a complicated or simple world where things are predictable, where things have the goal to be very stable and, and quality and, and all that, and that's needed. Looking into a complex world we have now in the organizations where there's in our case 150,000 people in 60 countries and four, 500 locations, or if you look into our global problems like nature or environment or energy and all those things, they're all complex. Now, if you try to put the old, I would call it the old, or this, this management behavior frame set onto complex problems, it doesn't work anymore. You cannot manage or micromanage nature. You cannot micromanage 150,000 people. Yeah? So our question is, if we now understand that roles, regulations, processes give an organization structure, and reliability and people know where, what they can believe and what they can do and what happens if they don't. That structure is surely needed, but it harms at the moment all these movements of agility, these movements of networks, these movements of uh, new work style mindset. And what we try to discuss with you here now is if we want to keep or enhance networking network organizations, if we want to enhance a hybrid work style or mobile work or agile work and all those things, what frame conditions, roles, regulations, processes, or organizational structures, informal networks, which are also part of a frame set, culture and values, and of course, leadership, what can be changed? What really uh, impactful things could we introduce if we would be CEO of the organization, if we would be able to do something, just be very creative. What can we change in terms of the frame conditions to support what we try to achieve with mindset tools and skills? With that, I would say. Perhaps as uh, I'm not in the camera, I turn on my camera here. Um, one addition, what I think, why, why I liked it, Harold, when you came up with the idea of the frame set, is a study that uh, Andrew McAfee did. I'm not sure. If I, does anybody know Andrew McAfee? Is this the name? It was uh, one of the major guys in the Enterprise 2.0 movement. We had in 2004, 2005, Web 2.0 as a thing. Before that, the web was only something to consume. I could read, I could order a book and pay for it, like transactional or for consumption. And the idea of Web 2.0 was to make the web participative. Like you can, you can interact with others. You can write an encyclopedia like Wikipedia. You can create your own blog without having to know what HTML and XML is and so on. So this was the Web 2.0 paradigm. And Andrew McAfee was the first one, was a Harvard professor, the first one coining the term Enterprise 2.0, meaning 
uh, adoption of social software and Web 2.0 tools in the organization and between the organizations and external entities like customers, partners, stakeholders uh, to, in a better way, reach the organizational goals. This was his definition. And he did a study like, uh, I think it was, the paper came out in 2006 and I think he did it in 2008 or 2009 because one hy hypothesis was that when all these younger people which he called Chen Z people and so on, when they come to the organization, they bring all the values that we need in Web 2.0 and they will transform the organization and they will bring all these, let's use a blog and not an email anymore and uh, stuff to the organization. And what they found is that the assimilation process is, is much faster than, than the transformational process due to these younger people. So the younger people in their private life, they chat with WhatsApp and they have their blog and they have a YouTube channel, but they come to the organization and they do all the bullshit stuff the organization did the 20 years before. And this was sort of a red light uh, where, where I like this idea of the frame set because in contrast to the mindset I have or the skills that I have, uh, when I come newly to an organization as a newbie, I'm I'm, confronted with this frame set and this forms how I am doing things, how my sort of mindset in the organizational context is, what I think we do it that way here. And therefore I like the idea and also the organizational psych psychologists and sociologists like Judith Muster and Stefan Kühl, we had them in the 2016 conference, they really hardly subtract human beings from the concept of the organization and with, with that definition of an organization, this is sort of the, the frame set thing. It's all the rules, all the processes, uh, rules written and unwritten and so on. And therefore, I like the idea to add that to the mindset, skills and tools set framework. To give you uh, very concrete um, experiences, what, what that means. Uh, imagine, or most of you don't have to imagine it, you are, you are bloggers, you are writing something in Mastodon or Twitter. So you're doing that because you believe in it, you're doing it because you think you have to tell something or you do it because you think someone else will benefit from that, right? So it's, it's a no-brainer, it makes sense. Now, if I put a rule on that and say, well, you're allowed to do that, but only if you get my approval. What's, what's the immediate reaction? self-censorship you immediately think okay oh do i write everything now can i write this can i write this now how do i write it that i get the approval how do i get the approval faster so it's just one little simple rule you can do whatever you like as before and i really mean it but put me on cc let me do the approval so that's one very simple thing in terms of just applying one rule and it will completely change the way how you do that. And I experienced that myself. I was in an HR project. It was a global HR project. And I was blogging for three years already in that organization. And, and everything was fine. And then I had to uh, be the change manager for that, for that project. And I started already blogging. And then the and I started already blogging. And then... basically the leader of that whole project said, but how I, I want to see that first. And it felt like I a Schreibblockade. <laughs> I had really, I was like, okay, what does that mean now for me? Do I have to write something he likes? Do I have to write something I want? Or do I need to formulate it somehow? And then, and what also happens with such frames, with such rules, whenever that a first rule is applied, a second one will follow very fast. What is the second one? Well, you find someone who proofreads it. Of course, I don't want to go to my boss with something. He comes back and say, hey, there's a comma and this term, uh, this is not really English. So you get to another person and you empower that person now, well, to do proofreading for you. And now the processes become longer and longer. And it's just one, one example of such very, very simple things. And now coming back to the question, if we want to have this sharing example, we have, most of the companies have a compliance department, right? Data protection, cybersecurity, legal. So there's a lot of organizational structures which make sure that the organization doesn't see any harm. Risk reduction, protection, and all those things. 
who of your organizations has a sharing department? A department making sure that what Conti knows is shared, what, what, because it's helpful, because the company needs that. Can you? <laughs> I think in theory, in our organization, Katharina from GIZ, that would probably be us. I'm um, uh, working in knowledge management very classically. Um, uh, um, yeah, I think, yeah, interesting uh, listening to you because we have this, uh, those conversations all the time between um, uh, compliance. We're a very compliance-based organization as a public sector organization, um, um, but we also have a, quite a strong culture of knowledge sharing. Um, I don't, um, I was just thinking, I'm not that sure but whether I really see that so strongly that organizations start fighting back. I think what we've experienced because, um, uh, well, you know, Office 365 was rolled out really quickly um, with COVID, uh, which was great and really unusual because in our organization, normally you would, it could have happened that, you know, you have a really long process of, um, you know, provisioning of Teams rooms, um, what is the right setup, and they did it really quickly. So we have a lot of problems now because, that, you know, there's no real provisioning of Teams rooms and so on and so forth, and it's quite messy. And it actually, so I, I experienced the kind of, I don't experience that as fighting back to putting a little bit more structure, but I experience it more as um, enabling, sharing in a sense. So, so my sense yeah, is a little bit that we've actually also experienced that, hmm, interesting, a lot more people participate in our internal conversations, um, voices that we've never heard from our country offices abroad. Um, and I think most people actually think that's that's a really good thing. But the main, you know, what you say around compliance and, and sharing is, um, yeah, it's, it's really around um, information security. And um, so in a fun fact, like, um, a couple of years back, I think we came with a new, um, what do we call it, um, a framework for knowledge and learning. And we put three principles. One was open knowledge. The other one was, um, was knowledge equity. And the third one was um, connection before content. And exactly at the same time, information security came with need to know <laughs> into the organization. Um, so we had a lot of interesting conversations around that. Now we've been thinking, you know, how, how are we going to resolve it? Does it make sense to have both hosted in the same department? So we had those conversations um, uh, in, in one loop. That would be interesting. I don't know what experiences are. Um, but generally, um, kind of need to know tends to rule a little bit, um, uh, even though in open knowledge, you know, there's a lot of business value in it. Um, yeah, but it's less, it, it appears in a first moment less risk related, um, because the way that we think about risk in organizations is about, you know, cybersecurity risks are very apparent risks, but the risks of not sharing are far less apparent. So I think that's an interesting conversation, perhaps in that context, could we think about risk differently? Anyway, that was a lot of waffling, but yeah. <laughs> We have two hands raised online. <laughs> uh, we'll take Manuela in. Yeah, thank you. So for me, this reason it's a lot with the um, spiral dynamics um, theory and the, um, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with Frederic Laloux and the reinventing organizations. So it's something I we experience as well. So and I experienced it even in my former company where, you know, you have a, a team of employees or a larger group of employees who would really like to drive things forward and who are self-organized and who can go without management and without micromanagement especially. And then there's this organization that strikes back because it tends to or it wants to keep its structures, it wants to keep its level. And I think these are the fights that we are um, experiencing, right? Because we want to go forward and we want to go to the future and, and make things easier and make things more fluent and be more free and the organization still is on a different level and i think the, the problem here is that if if you go into this theory it's it's also described that those different levels they are not compatible and they often don't even understand each other so i think there's a lot of work um translating the things from one level to the other so that the, the current management of the current organization understands and will become able to transform. Thank you. Barbara. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether I got the, uh, the whole thing right, but um, the, the, this idea of the assimilation 
uh, with young people coming in a company is faster than transformation in a more organized way. Um, I I quite believe that and I see that I work in a very, not so many people, but very international environment. Uh, we are based all over the world, basically, with not more than 300 people or 500 in one country. Um, what I also see is, and I'm not sure about it. I, I fully buy into this frame set adding to the to the three other components. Um, I'm not so sure whether I I would I believe that without the mindset of the top, um, the framework, or whether that how that interlinks basically the the mindset of the top management, let's say, with the frame set, because they if they really really would like to change or adapt their mindset or however you want to call it and put focus on that and not on the side, then that I would think interlinks. And the assimilation, yeah, it's a, it's a, a fair point and a um, strong point. However, what I see more in my everyday life um, is that where people rightly assimilate to a certain extent, and if there is too much assimilation needed, they will leave. They just go somewhere else. Um, that is what I, that is what I see. Um, I see at least Harald uh, nodding. I find, by the way, that I find really important in this remote world. Also, some uh, 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 facial reactions, <laughs> not only the word. Um, yeah, that's what I see in my, but it's, it's a small organization compared, for example, to Continent Time. What I'm saying is more an observation than anything based on research or something. Yeah, so I, I will be interested to learn if, if how that works, yeah, for example. No, I, I definitely can confirm that, that I don't think it's so a matter of how big an organization is. Um, and I'm quite sure some people are really leaving now organizations where they don't fit in the frame set anymore. Because people are more aware of their of their beliefs, and they they don't want to work for a weapon company or maybe for a tire company or whatever, because they because they think I have an uh, alternative now. The same yeah. as with I, I have an alternative now. I think does it make sense to drive in the office? And if I'm driving in the office and then sitting eight hours for in front of a teen screen, well, I might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. So as soon as I have the option, at least I have a discussion going on. And my, my question to that frame set would be really, does any one of you can name a rule, a role or a process which has been implemented to support any of those new work style values and other topics? We have, yeah, I see it. Uh, we have for everything basically <laughs> rules. But what I saw in the last decade, I would say, we implemented in most organizations values. What happens if you don't show those values? Are you still making a career? <laughs> no. What happens if you don't comply with the company strategy? Are you still making, if you make money despite uh, the company strategy of Continental is most attractive, most progressive, most, which would mean any benchmark shouldn't be possible because most means you are further down the road than anyone else. So you cannot compare to anyone else. So if I would really, really make sure that those modern things, network organization would mean <coughs> there is no boss. Do we have any of those rules, regulations and processes in place? Do you want to be my camera? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I don't have, as you probably expect, I don't have the answer to your question. Uh, however, um, when I heard your question, I was uh, thinking, uh, or it reminded me of what uh, Karl Heinz mentioned uh, this morning at the beginning of our conference today, because he was saying, on the one hand, uh, we are um, today we are working in an, an open environment in a bar camp. However, there is a rule, and to give you all as much freedom as possible, we need to stick to a certain uh, set of rules, and one is the timekeeping. So my, my question and my recommendation to you would be, would it, may, uh, would it be maybe valuable to, to have such a conversation with your organization? What is the, what is the, uh, the rule set which is relatively strict 
that everybody has to comply uh, with to enable everybody to live in a very flexible environment. That would be my contribution. I, I really like that, that picture because it's not only do we have, uh, it's not that I want those rules to make that clear. I'm, I'm not looking for now rules, regulations, even so the question might sound it. The question would also be, um, in the past, you had to be, as an employee, HR, human resources, from eight to five at a certain desk, doing a certain task, in a certain process, with a certain tool, and a clear outcome, and if that was not given, you would be kicked out. So that would be the maximum frame condition. Nowadays, you can basically work wherever you want, basically work in where, whenever you want. The results should somehow be there. So what would be those frame conditions? I see uh, Bernd and... There's an oh, there's an online. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Okay. Anshit, can you hear us? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so I just, I mean, one thing is, um, but that's not actually what I want to say. I mean, shouldn't we discuss at least, you know, holacracy and loop and all these things, whether that's not the rules that you are actually looking for, but that's not what I wanted to say. What I wanted to say is, um, I find it very interesting, you say the organization strikes back. And I'm wondering whether that's in fact partly competing commitments of the individuals that are striking back. And where I'm coming from is I recently read the book, um, um, oh God, my brain, Keegan Lacey, um, Immunity to Change. So basically saying, uh, this is for people who have a very strong goal. They are quite committed to this goal, but somehow let's say losing weight is always a good example, somehow they don't really make progress. And in fact, the, pro, uh, the process that they suggest is to help you figure out what are your competing <laughs> goals or your competing commitments that sort of keep you in balance. Like that could be, you know, your family shows you love by feeding you and you want to accept this love. Um, so you eat the pasta they make, they make you, yeah? And without this insight, you struggle like crazy to lose your bloody weight and you won't. And I think this is also what's happening in organizations. And as a manager, as an employee, let's take the example of the people who are assimilating. Their competing commitment is to, I guess, be like a good teammate or be seen as professional or blah, 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 whatever. So they are really rational in leaving behind behaviors that in fact they have adopted in their private lives. Yeah. All right. Um, I'd like to, to add another perspective about these cultures. And uh, I guess most of, uh, or, of our, our organizations have a kind of ordered culture. I work for an, for an organization where the CEO did not uh, leave out a week without sending out his message about his desired culture, about sharing, speak up culture, and so on and so forth. But uh, unfortunately, the culture is a different thing. It's a, it's a, it's a very it's, it's, it does not move fast and it does not move as desired by individuals or by managers. So if I experience that if I share uh, that I got a reaction that obviously have too much time, it might not be really serious, but it impacts me. And uh, so my suggestion would be that it's a good precondition that management spreads out desired cultures like speak up, like share, share whatever you like and be patient and establish, maybe establish peers, mentors that have really have impact, that means on a pretty high management level that act as a as a peer where I can ask this guy or this lady, uh, would you post this? Would you phrase it differently? And this is not an official role. It's just a peer-to-peer -peer coaching. Yeah. So as you know, Harald, we, we've talked a lot about the Kinabit framework before, <laughs> exactly for this reason here. Um, when 
I would like to open up something else in this discussion. And you talked about bigger organizations and um, there are reason why the agile framework was developed in the area of software development. So I guess there might be a reason behind this. Okay, why well, it did not happen in HR first. So uh, everyone can guess why. And um, and the re that's why I like so much the Kinevin framework, <clears throat> because when you when you look at that and you look at the different departments of your organization and you would say, OK, what's the predominant work they are doing in their part of the organization? Then you would see, OK, they are predominantly clear. They are predominantly doing projects and complicated. They are predominantly R&D development, doing new stuff. OK, so. I think what happens in some of the cases that there might be corners in your organization that already work chaotic and complex in a way because they have to, because the task they have is not onboarding a new person, it's developing a new product or a new service for you for the company. Now the conflict that happens, I think in the organization is when the parts of the organization that they, from, from their reality that they have, is not complex. And so they believe everyone's not complex. And then they go to this department and say, what do you do there? That's totally unstructured. Let me make put some structure in that because obviously you're wasting a lot of resources there. And that, that not just means that the whole organization at one point decides to become this way. I think the, the question is, what parts of the organization needs to work a certain way? And the rest of the organization should understand that how they work is not, it might work for them, but not might not work for the other group. Well, that basically says a one size fits all, no matter what kind of one size fits all doesn't work. It really has to work for the individual structure. Um, I just wanted to also reply to Antje what, what you mentioned uh, in terms of the system fights back. I know that's a very strong word uh, and I don't think that system strike can strike back. But, but by the example I made was making you a manager. Um, it has nothing to do with your person. It has nothing to do with being a good person or a negative person. As soon as I give you power and we know all those examples of jails where people gave some power and some not what, what people are capable for. So my question is now we have frame sets now we have rules in many areas formal clarifications and many things we've done in the last 10 years they have been informal is that the way to go or should we somehow try to find a mix in between i mean if you're in front of a police officer running over a red light because it completely makes sense because there's no car wherever you still will get fined, right? Thanks. Uh, I wanted to get back to your point before I, maybe they can see me in the other com camera, um, about who has experience with uh, organizations without rules. I work in a small uh, consulting company. We try to get along with as few processes and rules as possible, so that's a good thing. Our processes are lean all fine and our people are quite senior. They're running client projects uh, all on their own. Uh, and at the beginning of the year, our two bosses tried to introduce a new uh, parallel organization to explore new topics about new work, about AI, whatever, new topics. And everybody came, was able to come up with uh, topics uh, he or she would like to work on. And so, Organize yourself. Mm -hmm. You are the owner of your topics. And so now we had a topic owner meeting without any rules, do whatever you like. And for me, that was like, oh, it's like a bar camp session. That, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and for many others, well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what they want from us. Uh, should we do it like this or like that? Let's ask them first to be on the safe side. And also, they are quite senior. They are still not used to having this completely free room that's almost scary uh, or, or feeling uncomfortable. Uh, and we, we needed a, a few rounds, a couple of meetings to, to really get into some sort of a working mode. And so it's okay to define our own 
rule set, uh, how do, do we organize ourselves, what kind of documentation are we setting up, how do we report back our topic, uh, new topic ideas to, to the leadership. Um, and that, and we, we did some sort of a retro and said, well, uh, we couldn't really start with that because we didn't know where to go and, and how to go there. And they said, yeah, we wanted to give you this freedom, but we understand that at least some communication would be would have been helpful uh, to start with, some sort of guidelines, uh, et cetera. Well, what is our plan with that? Uh, so that we better understand, is this a good idea or is, the, yeah, is it censorship or is it uh, trying to find ideas that uh, have sort of a business value? And we're now getting along with that and uh, it's getting better, but it was a struggling start. I missed the, the first part of the discussion, so sorry if I'm going off the off the cliff now. But I think for me the biggest problem uh, is we're, we're moving from this complicated to complex. You know, we're sitting halfway in between, and we're still trying to solve the problems we have with the tools from the complicated area. You know, so and there is rules and regulations, and we we need those because otherwise we move into chaotic. But we need to find a distinction. Where do we still need rules, frameworks, and so forth? And where do we let go? Otherwise, we're not finding our way through the jungle. I think this is, for me, the main challenge at the moment. You know, How much rules and regulations do we need in order to not go chaotic? And where do we have to let go and you know, probe, sense, try things out, and respond, You know, rather than analyze, check, fix, move on? So this is the problem that I'm currently having in my role. Thanks. Yeah, talking about the rules that are needed, um, there is an interesting method out of the Liberating Structures tool set. It's called MinSpecs. Maybe some of you know that, uh, that that's really helpful. So you start with the purpose or the, the intended outcomes of a new project initiative whatsoever. And then you list all the do's and don'ts that you can think of. And then one by one, you test every do or don't, so every rule whether it can be violated while still achieving the purpose. And then you end up with really the minimal list of things that yeah, are needed and sometimes rules are needed. So I can really recommend that as an inter interesting method and very powerful. <laughs> For the onliners, we protected uh, a water uh, flood here on a computer. Um, Antje, I, I see your hand uh, just as a as a suggestion, maybe because uh, triggered by what you just uh, what you just mentioned, Gerd. Yeah. Um, if we look in today's organizations, we have rules on various levels. Let's put it like that. So we have uh, some some organizations have rules how to hold a pen, so to say, and some others have a rule how to write something, and some others have a rule if you are allowed to publish something. So I would say rules are on different levels. Now, uh, I just had uh, last year, there was a, a presentation from a guy in the Agile World Conference, and he was talking about how um, Tesla works and how those organizations are working. And what I really liked in terms of one of those rules, um, in, in, in the old days, I would have said, before Corona, there was a clear structure when you have to appear in the office. So everybody had to start, let's say, at eight. Then over time, we had shift time. So people had to start from eight to 10 somewhat. And then nowadays it's basically in many areas you can, well, do your work. So there is already a, um, a softening of the rules. And what he basically has in his very, very few roles, he said, well, if there is a date, you can, you can basically not come, you can be away. There's always things happening, there's complexity, but there's this one rule, make sure everybody knows what's happening. And, and that is a rule, basically, it's, I, I would summarize that on the feedback. If I'm responsible for or being part in a team being somewhere, if I'm making sure that my team does not have to wait for me, that if I have to share something and they're expected to be shared, that I, they know why am I doing it, not, why am I not doing it, or when am I do, uh, will do it. So it's all more from going away from hard rules to a very, very concrete communication between each other. And maybe if we find some 
guidelines, rules, something in between the, the hard carved in stone. And if you don't, you get punished things and something in terms of uh, values, which are probably for many people just too weak to, to comply with it. Finding something in between, we can get into a guided way of freedom. Uh, uh, Angie, sorry, online. Oh, online. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that sounds, uh, it's a very good example. I was uh, thinking back to the question, you know, where can we find something in between like the hard rules and the, you know, the bottom up stuff that has been happening. And I'm wondering, I mean, the rules or the, the structures we have, the KPIs, all this um, hard stuff. I mean, it's there to structure the conversations that people are having. Because in the end, only the if you have the right conversations with the right people on the right topic at the right time, you are running your business well. So now the question is, are the structures still, in fact, helping the right conversations with the right people, blah, blah? Maybe not. Maybe we need to change the structures. But, I mean, if we want to go get give more attention to staff, we either need to change the structures to make it happen that way, or we need top management to give it more attention. Because in a hierarchical structure, this is what's happening. Everybody's just looking at what gives my boss attention to, all the way up to the top. And if you just imagined that all the way from the top, the people, the question the bosses would ask would, what did you, what did you learn last week from a fuck up or whatever? I mean, if that was the top thing that everybody was asking each other, the business would be run in a completely different way. And maybe not in a good way, but I mean, just as an example, at the moment, the conversations that people are having is, I don't know, how many widgets did you produce last week? And that's where the attention goes. That's normal. And, and just to add, and it becomes even harder if the organization is uh, struggling in terms of uh, getting uh, not the parts or having problems with the customer. Some people say there's issues with automotive or so. So whenever pressure comes to the organization, it, I, I have the feeling it falls back to what they can rely on, and that's rules, regulations, and processes, because they are written on, they are being measured by it, they are KPIs, they are... Well, if I if I fall, comply with that rule, they cannot kick me out. Something like that. So I, I think that is a big part. If everything's fine, everything's running smooth. I guess everybody can every company can be new work style. But being new work style when there's pressure. You have a microphone. But you can finish your sentence. No, I guess it's. <laughs> I was just raising my hand. <laughs> Um, uh, I think um, uh, the point where I don't agree with is I don't think it's rules against no rules and uh, hierarchical versus new work style organizations. There's hardly um, uh, more rule based organizations um, uh, than holocratic organizations. They're incredibly bureaucratic and incredibly formalized. Um, uh, and I think, um, uh, Simon, you mentioned uh, Stefan Kuh has, has written a, a book about it, which is really interesting. He's also written another one, which is um, called um, uh, uh, der, I think it's got a blog, Der ganz formale Wahnsinn vom Nutzen des Regelbruchs in, uh, in Organisationen. I'll put it in the chat. I don't know if it's available in English, but it's really interesting because he goes into, you know, what are rules and how useful is it to actually allow for certain um, uh, aberrations or mistakes to be made. So I don't think the question is rules or no rules because we have certain rules here in this room. And as soon as you have people together, you'll have rules. You know, it's just sort of, you know, um, it's also not uh, so much about hard rules against soft rules. I don't think um, agile organizations have got softer rules. They have different ones. And sometimes some of them might not actually work for organizations. But I find those conversations interesting that we're having right now. So, for instance, you know, what um, uh, just, you know, because that example came um, uh, mobile work or, you know, being in the office um, nine to five. So at the moment we have a fairly, you know, clear rule, you know, you can work um, uh, from somewhere else, mobile, um, up to, I think, 10 days a month, and the rest is supposed to be in the office, but it's all also, you know, you can also have exceptions. So, um, uh, and, the, uh, and in the end, we had all exceptions, so, you know, meaning that certain colleagues, you know, you'd never see, like, for months, um, uh, you know, at least in person. And the team actually then came together and said, we, we want this differently, because we noticed when we get together, we work better, you know, and started negotiating. Um, different rules um, uh, sort of for ourselves and those are interesting conversations and um, and I think there's something perhaps in there you know how much um, uh, is required by the organization how much can individual teams decide because um, Bernd what you said I think is also important um, 
teams function differently in an organization, you know, and your R&D department might want something different from the accountants um, uh, and so on and so forth. But yeah, I don't think it's an either or, and because I have the, all these reading tips uh, also. Yeah. You? Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I see there are still hands up online. Please do not hesitate and uh, share your thoughts via our Discord chat or um, on the concert board. Um, I think there's much to learn, much to discuss on this topic. So um, thank you. Thanks. And just as a final remark, we do a group picture at 1 p.m. on the stage. So if you go to lunch, just tell it everybody who sits beside you that a lot of people will be at stage at 1. <laughs>